Daniel Hussey. How are you, buddy? Hey, Dale. How's it going? You guys hear me all right? Yeah, loud and clear. Perfect. Perfect. Top of mind today? Uh, you know, I figured we could come up to speed with what we talked about uh, a little bit before. Um, I know I was one of your you know, S&P bulls back uh, when we first, uh, or, or with our last interview a few months ago. Um, not much has changed from my long-term perspective, but certainly in the medium term, I think, you know, the other analysts uh, that I heard speak in there for, through the first part of uh, the webinar, um, I think every, there, there was a lot of, or, or the, I agree with what was being said in terms of the sideways choppy nature that we're seeing. I mean, you, you said it yourself earlier that that 4,200 level uh, in the S&P, let me throw some charts up now, um, was a great area to consider for not only resistance, right, but what the bulls were, you know, looking to achieve. And then you also pointed out how, right, sellers were are looking to sell into that or ahead of that 4,200 area um, where there is a, you know, a, a, a very clear proven resistance um, over the last several months. I mean, going back yeah, to the September, whole, the whole right? world's looking at that 4,200 is like a neckline. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, could be an eight sending triangle. Uh, 4,200 is going to measure pretty big, isn't it? On a breakout. Technicians are going to probably say at least 46 since the recent move's been from 38 to 42, right? Just yeah, I just stepped out. Handles. I just stepped out to a daily chart there to show that whole, you know, the whole uh, breadth of this market from 4,800 down to 3,500 um, from December of 22 uh, all yeah. the way through December of 23. Um, the whole year of consolidation that was 2022 so far. And 2023 is not starting off <laughs> much different. We've just reverted back to the mean, if you will, of that price range. Um, yeah. And we seem to be putting up a fight over the trend uh, is the best way I could describe it at this point. Um, certainly in the near term, uh, this that consolidation pattern, I think you guys, I heard a megaphone or you know expanding triangle could be thought of um, where the market's traded both sides of the book, as we like to say. We, we set a high and a low here in early trade for April, uh, you know, 41, 71. And this is the E-mini S&P uh, futures, everybody. I've got the continuous contract up. So you're seeing the June contract price action in these first, you know, candles over here. But once we go further back, right, it's another contract. But generally speaking, it tracks the index uh, rather closely <laughs> because it is a futures contract that at its expiration has to <laughs> has to uh, be equal to that that index price. So with that being said, um, okay. High was set, okay. low was set, and we just expanded that range right for the last month and a half. Okay. So uh, do you have a view on the Fed and what's going on here? I mean, uh, I'd like to discuss, you know, S&Ps and so forth, but do you have a view on that? You know, I, I believe that Paul had to know what position the banks were in before he embarked. You and would hope. Right. I, I, you know, uh, he has some of the best researchers in the world and, and they're in the market. So they knew who was buying during QE. They, you know, you, you know, brought up the best point there. They were all in the market, right? Yeah. I mean, it's something yeah. that comes a little, becomes a little shocking when you digest it, that policymakers are actually placing, you know, personal bets uh, and speculating, so to speak. Um, it's a shocking revelation of the last few years, but it also, I think, should give some more credence to the knowledge, right, base that they're coming from in their decision-making process, because they do have skin in the game in more ways than one. Not only is their career and their public reputation on the line, which we know in the you know court of public approval, you can be torn apart these days for one misstep. Um, and certainly our Fed shares are no, you know, are, are, are subject to that kind of scrutiny. Plus, you know, they're putting financial risk and personal capital uh, and the markets. Not that I think it's necessarily right, because I do believe there's a conflict of interest there. But if you play devil's advocate, um, they're probably doing so to try to make money and to try to not lose. So uh, they're also right gaining some knowledge of what the market is 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 doing and, and participating in that conversation um that's capitalism uh folks and this is bigger to, than their this know. is bigger 
right than the personal Ex trading. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So, um, so you know, to come uh, back now to answer your question. OK, um, go ahead. I think that the Powell and the Fed have made <laughs> personally, I feel like they should have been a little quicker to raise rates. OK, because inflation clearly uh, and headline inflation clearly ran rampant there. Uh, and it was a little bit of egg on the face with the whole transitory conversation. However, I do think you're right. I think they were very knowledgeable in terms of the system and the the um, how much money was in the financial system as a whole and that the next you know credit cycle where they had to raise interest rates. Uh, and in, you know, over the last couple of years, this has resulted in a massive right decline in the Fed uh, fund futures and uh, a massive rally in, in the real rates, which I saw you're looking at some rate charts there. And we'll talk. I could I, I agree with you. I think there's a multi month uh, consolidation here that kind of like the S&P, if we push above resistance here or, you know, the S&P were to push below support if, if we're going higher on the bonds, it's probably yeah. indicative of of right some of that that fear and that volatility coming back in the marketplace, the risk off nature that we see when uh, the, the Fed is, is easing. Um, but I do think they've backed themselves somewhat into a corner now because the sacrificial lamb is that mid-tier bank. Um, the bank that didn't have enough liquidity to meet right runs on deposits um, and banks might be in trouble, but I don't believe the entire system as a whole is in trouble. Uh, as we can see, PNC, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they're having a field day coming out uh, and uh, Chase, they're having a field bank coming out and buying in, uh, these banks yeah, and fixing cheap assets. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Like it is a it is a the rich are getting richer, so to speak, uh, at the sacrifice of what the is Fed's kind of, friends. Those are mm -hmm. Jamie Diamond. They're absolutely. They're Okay, and, so and they've had anyway. 10 years of easy money and and quantitative easing, so to speak. So uh, they're flush. Um, yeah. and, and I think when they you talk about the litmus test or uh, the Fed uh, trying to do um, oh, what do they call that test? But anyway, um, right. They do um, a Rorschach, a Rorschach. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's which it's, is what. <laughs> It really is, right? You're looking at numbers and hoping that it's big enough to absorb. I any saw kind a video of on. I, I saw a title on a video yesterday sure. that the title was um, "Paul wants you wants to drive you crazy." So you know, keep you. you know, I don't know. Is he driving the market crazy? And what what do you do with fresh cash right now? How, so how are you deploying it? A, a trade that I think is maybe maybe getting overcrowded, but it was one that we talked about into this year was uh, the yeah. precious metals. Um, yeah. You know, there's yeah. other asset classes outside of right fiat currency to look at. People will right. talk Bitcoin too. Uh, that's that's another conversation. But I think precious metals, the confirmation of the inflation trade that precious metals are starting to show, putting pressure on all time highs for gold, putting pressure, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, in a proverbial bull trend right now to keep that trend going. Um, that's a bullish development that we didn't have last year. Um, yeah. Last year, gold was a dog. Um, it tried yeah. with crude to break out and it just couldn't. Um, and if anything, that was maybe a wet blanket on the that whole notion of inflation or the traditional inflation trade, right? Before Bitcoin, before anything, gold was the uh, the, the, the asset to hold if you were fearful of inflation. Um, and uh, it, and that's a tale as old as time, right? Um, now there's other, you know, we've diversified those asset classes a little bit, but gold being in a, in a, in a proverbial bull trend still uh, and silver starting to catch up a little bit are, I think, two developments that are worth, you know, considering and talking about. Now, gold's gotten a little overbought. We're at the high end of the range. I would caution anyone, you know, to uh, trading leveraged gold at this point. But I think bullion is an interesting place uh, that, you know, is the sleeping, the, the sleeping giant, if you will, that when it starts to wake up, everybody pays attention and it's often too late. Okay. All right. So metals, uh, you have a view on the dollar, Daniel. I do. Let me throw up the Dixie here. Um, I've been a bit of a bear um, for this decline and not that I'm turning bullish, but I am impressed Um impressed with how this hundred figure in the index is holding. Um, I don't trade the index. I would prefer to trade individual crosses, but I think the index is right. As a whole is a good barometer still. Um, 
And while we remain below that 18 day moving average, uh, which is a typical trend, very simple trend indicator that I use on a daily chart, um, I do remain, you know, w under the impression that the down or, in, or short term trend is lower. But the dollar seems to be holding this 100 figure uh, as support now. And when we take a step back on the continuation chart for the index, that 100 figure becomes very important to the last yeah. you know, decade um, where we just couldn't break out of it from 14 on uh, and yeah. then have finally did it right this last year. <clears throat> um, yeah. Coming back to test old resistance as support, you know, even even though I kind of want to see the dollar break back down into that eighty to hundred dollar range, you know, from <laughs> a, a somewhat selfish standpoint of I prefer a weaker dollar um, because I'm a commodities broker and and commodities often uh, benefit from weak the weaker dollar. Um, but I believe breaking back below that hundred figure would be technically significant. But while we remain above it, and certainly over the last um, 48 hours of starting to break back above that 18 day moving average. I think that there's a short term consolidation here back above 102. We're talking about reversion to the mean 55 and 100 day moving averages are at 103. The 200 day has been untested up at 10570 right now. Um, yeah. I, you know, I got to call this a range between 105 and 100 until it's not, uh, which means maybe the dollars due for a period of strength here. And if we flip back over to that 30 year chart for a minute, Dollar strength oftentimes correlates with, you know, declines in the 30 year note or a rate rallying environment for the U.S. You know, this 133 to 132 area has been very formidable resistance. It's also old support from April through July of last year uh, that we broke down below, have come back up. We've set into a consolidative range in the bonds. And if we break back below 129, not to say that's the same as the 100 figure, but you know, stars aligning, the, 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 the treasuries lower, the dollar higher. Those are things that we expect to see correlate together. And mm -hmm. if gold's at resistance as well, that all might be, you know, filling into the idea that the dollar might have a period of strength. Maybe commodities have a period of weakness right now. Um, I think that when you look at crude and row crops and corn, wheat, beans and cattle and well, cattle is a little different story, but hogs, certainly price of pork hasn't been this cheap in a while. Um, there's some truth to the the fact that the dollar um, might be putting in some support, and that might be putting on a wet blanket on some commodity markets. Um, what so do we'll you see. think of the grain complex in here, Daniel? I this is the time of year where I could have uh, you know a four hour discussion on the grain uh, complex. Uh, we are in the midst of planting season, and we just had a planting progress report that came out uh, yesterday that has us you know the second fastest on record soybean planting and a very fast corn planting. Um, but this is a year where weather is going to be very important. Grain stockpiles coming into this year. In other words, what's left over from carry last over. year's, correct, carryover. What's left over from last year's production, um, because remember folks, grain is only produced in every field, you know, one time a year with the exception of South America that have the blessing of a second crop. Um, you, there's only one, generally one harvest for each hemisphere, which means we can take an economic approach to balance sheets. Look at supply and demand. We know how much was produced. We know how much gets effectively eaten and how much is left over for the next year. Well, then we'll put more seed in the ground, produce another crop, and we can monitor those stockpiles as, along the way. We're pretty tight. In other words, there isn't much left over from last year. So that means this year's production needs to be really big to get us out of these tight, tight areas. And that's a big reason why the price of corn went to $7. The price of beans was at fifteen and sixteen dollars a bushel. These were prices that were at three dollars and six dollars a bushel a couple of years ago. So we have doubled right. the price of these commodities. Um, which, when we talk foodstuffs, that's that's when inflation gets scary. Um, yeah, because uh, the Fed can't print corn. It absolutely, and when prices of food goes too high or we don't have enough, people die, and that is a you know it becomes a humanitarian issue, um, not just a financial one. Are you uh, keeping an eye on the Pacific and the shift from La Nina to an El Grande, El Nino? We are. And I'm not a huge climatologist or meteorologist, but right, as a I row am. crop. <laughs> as a ask, me, ask me what the weather is like right now sure. where I'm at. Sure. Well, how it's, is the weather? It's, like? it's uh, dark. We're, it's still dark outside. <laughs> well, this, and the sun, later on, I'm expecting light. 
It, well, that's uh, through my window. That's sure. Carlin, right? <laughs> Hippy dippy weatherman. Uh, it's true anyway. though. And that backyard philosophy of weather uh, can skew our, uh, you know, the bigger picture because we already have drought complexes going on in the yeah. Southwest. Um, right. There's a reason why, and for those not familiar with wheat, there are multiple types of wheat in the world. Um, Chicago wheat is just one variety, which when we look at a a hell of a reversal last week, (laughs) hell of a reversal right into 50% retracements for Chicago wheat uh, and uh, and into old support. So that's the big question is we know how short this market's gotten from a commitment of traders standpoint. The million dollar question is, is this a short covering rally? Was this a bear market rally or is this a true reversal? And when we look at the different types of wheat contracts we have, Chicago wheat being the soft soft wheat that's used in pastas, uh, it's used in some pastries. It's not what we make bread out of, and it's not the internationally traded wheat. When we look at international wheat, we're really talking about the KC um, hard red winter. This wheat is really your bailey wick, isn't it? Daniel? Correct. Eggs. And, yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Right. This is. And so, yeah, for those that aren't, aren't aware, I'm a commodities and futures broker. I deal in all of the future, the whole future spectrum, but my specialty is in the row crops and helping producers in that space manage their risk and hedge. Exactly. So we're using these rallies right now to help farmers, producers, elevators, people with actual exposure manage their production schedule via the board. Um, We're selling into this rally in some cases, but we also use this big decline in row crops to do what's called re-ownership via calls and call spreads. Because later in the year, we know we're going to have to sell our grain. And if we think these are the lower prices for the year, which seasonally I believe we're seeing right now, and we're seeing, you know, these short covering rallies in a market that has gotten very short when we look at the commitment of traders, when we look at, hey, just daily stochastic RSI, all those things, row crops got a little oversold here. And so now we're seeing that short covering rally begin. It's happening at a time that's very interesting in the fundamental cycle because we have a planting going on, which now all of a sudden weather really matters, right? Uh, And while I claim I'm not a weatherman and I'm not a meteorologist, doesn't mean I don't follow it because right? Rain makes grain. Um, And this KC contract, the reason it's at such a premium to the Chicago is because the areas of the country where KC wheat is grown, half of the state of Kansas is in a very, very, is in record drought conditions, um, as is parts of Oklahoma and Texas. So at $8.40 a bushel for July KC wheat, uh, that stands, you know, at a two dollar premium to the six dollars and forty cents a bushel yeah. of Chicago wheat. Uh, and if you look at the chart, Chicago wheat rallied up into old support. Uh, now is resistance. Maybe it's rolling over. There's a reason Chicago wheat has been heavily sold into. Um, while other wheat contracts like the spring or heavy KC wheat, if we look at that same decline from February March highs down through April. We did not stop at that 50%. We did not stop at old support, right? We have more of a range. This um, is a higher beta wheat. Correct. It's a higher beta wheat. There's more value to it. And and there's a protein premium that is derived from it. There's all these reasons why KC wheat is is a better quality product than Chicago and why it's driving a a premium. But it's interesting that even technically on the chart, um, we're seeing those developments. Yeah. (laughs) So... (laughs) Um, so, you know, one thing I am, you know, a couple of last things I'm eyeing here in the row crops, um, the beans and corn have generally been in very, uh, large ranges over the last, uh, several months, uh, really for beans, you go back a year, yeah. uh, they were the big leaders coming out of yeah. COVID with oil, corn, and beans. Those were our three products that were really inflating from 2020 through 2022 before other markets started to catch wind. Uh, and then over the last year or so, these markets have hit, I won't, don't want to say record highs, but when we look at the price of corn and beans relative to historical value, they've hit very high prices and we're just hanging on up here. Um, yeah. The price of soybeans is, in at least for July soybeans, which is our current front month future, um, has been range bound for the last several months to a year. Um, this $15 to $14 range seems to be at play. Uh, we have an open gap on the chart down at 1351, which in row crops, when we leave open gaps like this, we tend to be very bullish until they they fill. But the fact that we're kind of consolidating up here leads me to believe that, okay, 
1400 might be very important support, right? We've had constant support there since uh, September of last year. There's upward sloping trend lines that have held there. Uh, and, um, uh, excuse me, and if we uh, look at the beans could go, uh, could be in the $20 range, $20 handle. It, well, yeah, if you think this consolidation will continue higher, right? Which it yeah. could. There's no reason it couldn't. Um, but I, I like to point out to traders that there's a very clear line in the sand, technically, that if we break back, back below 1400, right? Um, yeah, we could go to 12. Right. There's there's a there's a good reason to think you could be testing down to 13 and, and 12. Yeah. Um, but while above, um, it's support until it's not uh, as is 15, you know, 1540 resistance until it's not up there. There's plenty of reasons to, uh, and trend lines. But um, the point being is that we have these sideways range bound markets in lots of places. And, and so I'm not very amped to rush in here from a speculative standpoint and buy corn, uh, wheat and beans. But from a producer's hedger standpoint, the way we look at those ranges, this is the time to be doing your re-ownership strategy, which is because we know we're going to have to sell our crop later in the year. Part of our, you know, managing our margins as a producer is locking in our right uh, yeah. sale prices when 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 they're the highest, and and then potentially even owning that crop again when it's the lowest, because every year we're going to have to deliver a crop whether we make it in the field or not. And to bring things full circle to your El Nino question earlier. El Nino years in a super El Nino cycle, the farmer's arm neck will tell you are our hottest summers and yeah. can be our driest, right? Yeah. Um, and if you get one of those heat domes that we had back in 2012 sitting over the Midwest this summer, it doesn't matter how many carry acres. Over. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how many acres you plant. If you don't get rain, you don't grow grain. Um, and certainly if it's too hot, even if you get rain. <laughs> but the point being is bad weather with a tight carry out can send these markets very, you know, volatile to the upside right? um, for all the wrong reasons. Um, and we always talk about volatility to the downside, but in, it's in row crops where volatility to the upside becomes a really scary um, uh, proposition. Reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Daniel, uh, best place for people to reach you, reach out to you at your on your Twitter at Daniel Hussey Jr. Yep, or, you can find me on Zayner. You can find me at uh 312-277-0110. Daniel Hussey uh, Jr. there on Twitter at Dan S O T D on Facebook or D Hussey at Zayner.com. Go ahead and I'm shooting my info there um into uh the webinar chat. Uh, feel free to get in chat. It, it, you know, if you have any questions about uh, commodities, you have qu questions about uh, futures, or you know how to get involved in those uh, uh, in in, the, in that that area of the market. What are you? Always here for a conversation. Do you? Uh, let me ask you, Daniel. Do you you go down to an office? Uh, where in the city are you? We're at 150 South Wacker, so it's oh, right across okay. the kitty corner from across the river from the Mercantile that? Exchange building. Yeah, I remember. Okay. Yeah. All right. Miss it sometimes. You ever yeah, play that a... song, Illinois by Dan Fogelberg? Uh, yes. And that and, and another favorite uh, from Alahud Haynes and Jeremiah, Lakeshore Drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, you know, good I'm times. out here in California, so that song, Illinois. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure like it'll be. Then. Huh? <laughs> I'm sure you'll be enjoying that you're 75 and sunny <laughs> all year round. Well, I'm I'm in a uh, more like the higher desert now. But uh, do you think people should go out and buy a silo and fill it and hold it? So, if you are fearful of the devaluation of the dollar, if you're fearful yeah. of inflation, right? Um, yeah. That's a strategy that everywhere else in the world is actually literally utilized. Uh, really? Argentinian and Brazilian farmers are notorious for leaving their grain in the bin because it's more valuable to, the, to them as an international asset in the bin as a store of wealth than their currency, the Brazilian real or the Argentinian yeah. peso, which both have been, you know, rampantly devalued, um, it's throughout history and are some of the more volatile currencies that inflation is often the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest enemy of. Um, so they will use ex that strategy and farmers in the U S do the same thing. Um, yeah. and it's a way it, and, and it's so also I'm not crazy. I wasn't no. crazy when I told people to do that. No, you're not. If, if, they you, the room. if you want to buy bullion for that purpose, why would you not want to own a silo full of wheat? If the wor world yeah. really were to end, 
who's going to eat your gold? Yeah, well, you know, Joseph was my is my uh, model, the the most heroic commodity trader of all time. <laughs> it's so, it's biblical, man. Yeah. It is. Uh, uh, it was great talking to you again. Daniel. You too, Dale. Thanks for having me on, everybody. Take care. Uh, People and enjoyed you. They're asking for your contact information. So now's a good time to, you know, look at commodities, especially if you're a dollar bear. It is. It is. It's the only other way of diversifying into real assets other than owning land, right? Um, yeah. So, well, well, thanks for having me on, Dale. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Root, we root for you, Daniel. Good <laughs> thanks, hunting. Everybody. Good hunting, buddy. All right, uh, everyone, that's a wrap. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, George. I'm glad you enjoyed Dan. You know, he really has a lot of knowledge about what comes out of the ground. So uh, if you want to learn, there you go. And uh, you could join uh, the team in 17 minutes on the morning edge. Uh, even though Steve says, you know, it, it's time to de be watching. That is valuable time because that's what's going to lead you to something that's going to be so compelling. You won't be able to just sit, but just be patient and let it come to you. And the trade will look so good you can't help yourself except to take some risk. Don't force it. If you're going uh, hunting, from going from screen to screen, from instrument to instrument, saying, I have to find a trade, shut your platform off right now and go take a walk. And don't just count your pips, count your blessings, guys and gals. See you tomorrow. Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video. Uh -huh.